Welcome to this episode of Innovating Employment, a podcast by and for workforce development professionals, brought to you by the Ontario Centre for Workforce Innovation. This podcast series asks leaders across the workforce development sector to share their ideas, experiences, and solutions for meeting Ontario's workforce needs. I'm your host and producer, Noah Snyderman. Today's special episode was recorded in partnership with Ryerson's Campus Community Radio Station, CJRU 1280 AM, at the Future of Work Conference hosted by Ryerson's Faculty of Communications and Design. Future of Work opened with a fascinating keynote speech from Professor Mark Banks of the University of Leicester, warning about the potentially negative effects of growth in the creative sector, and how a focus on growth for growth's sake can reproduce inequality. After the keynote came three terrific panels focused on the response of creative workers to disruption, labor law, policy, and workers' rights, and the role of industry and post-secondary in preparing the next generation of workers. We got a chance to interview Professor Banks about his book, Creative Justice, Cultural Industries, Work, and Inequality. We also spoke with panelist Dr. Miranda Campbell of Ryerson's School of Creative Industries, as well as two graduates of the program, Fiona Kenny and Naomi Brearley, about how schools are preparing students to enter the creative sector. One of the biggest challenges discussed at the FCAD Future of Work Conference is that the creative industries are in a constant state of disruption. The platforms on which so much of creative work rely upon, be it Facebook, Google, or Amazon, are constantly updating and iterating, leaving creative workers to update their skill sets in real time. In the context of the creative industries, the word expertise can sometimes have a bit of a different meaning. Here's Dr. Miranda Campbell. As a teacher, I try to instill in my students the importance of being adaptable, uh, the importance of being able to improvise, the importance of being able to take whatever's thrown at you with confidence. Uh, when you're asked, can I, can, if you can do a certain task, you say yes. If you feel like you can do it, if you're comfortable uh, saying, sure, right? Kind of being resilient and rising to the challenge. Uh, because of the nature of the, the creative industries, they're always changing. Um, expertise sometimes doesn't really exist. Uh, so why not call yourself an expert if you feel like you can hack it and try to make a go of it? Jason Maganoy, Director of Business Development for Now Magazine, spoke after Dr. Campbell on the panel. When it comes to hacking it, Jason's a shining example. My background is I'm a playwright. I also work in corporate sponsorship and in marketing, and I'm the Director of Business at Now. When I applied for the job at Now, there was no job for me. So Alice made one up. She gave me a job that didn't exist. So I was just this guy who was around doing things for a lot of different departments. I launched a store, so I launched an e-commerce platform. I launched a ticketing solution. I launched a custom content platform solution. And I had never sold a print ad in my life, and 98% of their revenue came from print. Do I know how to launch a store? Do I know how to launch a ticketing solution? Do I know how to do custom content? Kind of. And I think that is something that you're going to discover in your life as you enter the space. You're kind of, you're, when you see a job posting, you kind of can do it. So in the end, it's about how you position what you can do to help you push you in the direction to the things that you want to do. We also spoke with one of Dr. Campbell's former students, Fiona Kenny, a versatile creative in her own right, about how the Creative Industries program prepares students for rapidly transforming types of work. Here's what she had to say. I, in four years, have been involved in fashion, then interior design and architecture, which are like similar industries, but they're also distinct um, in a lot of different ways. And so the idea that I've been able to work and study and sort of communicate in these three different industries is kind of testament to that. Um, the fact that, yeah, it, it's necessary that you be able to sort of be adaptable and like versatile and move around between these industries. And I think that's why this program in specific is so relevant and important um, because I've applied for jobs that are completely different from things that I've done before or things that I like literally did not have experience for, but I'm able to make the case that I'm qualified because I took like, you know, these two classes in second year or like there was this piece of a class that I did or this this part of my internship that somehow is related to this new thing. So yeah, I definitely think it's A, being really versatile and adaptable, but also B, knowing how to um, 
sort of take stock of your skills and like being able to communicate those things. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's not just sort of being a jack of all trades, but it's also being able to like market that for yourself. When numerous creatives are competing for work that didn't exist a year ago, it can become a challenge to distribute work opportunities based on experience or expertise. So how are these positions and opportunities being distributed to creative workers? This is one of Professor Mark Banks' main concerns in his book, Creative Justice, Cultural Industries, Work and Inequality. We got a chance to sit down with him after the conference to talk about creative justice, talent, internships, and his advice for young people entering the creative industries. So, Mark, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you for joining the podcast. Thank you for the invitation. Um, To start off, can you tell us a bit about the evolution of your book, Creative Justice, Cultural Industries, Work and Inequality? Yes. um, The book really is, I suppose, the culmination of maybe 10 years thinking. So, well, I say eight years thinking, maybe two years writing. Um, And I've been researching the cultural industries or the creative industries, as some people call them, for the best part of two decades. And I wrote a book in 2007 called The Politics of Cultural Work, which really set out some of the basic interests I had in work and employment in the in the cultural industries. Um, and in the years since, I've become aware that there's been a huge expansion of writing around work employment, particularly precarious work and employment and issues around inclusion and diversity in the cultural and creative industries. And really, it's snowballed to become quite a um, you know a hot academic topic. Um, and by the time I'd come to uh, start thinking about writing another book, I was aware that I was writing in a different context, where there was a lot of data, a lot of information about precarious, insecure, low-paid uh, work in these sectors. And so I was thinking, well, what do we do with all this data? We know a lot about the c- cultural sector. We know that it's producing certain kinds of work, which is detrimental in some senses, as well as being you know, a good opportunity. So I wanted to write a book that both reflected on that huge amount of data that we'd um, generated, and but also, I suppose, took us in a different direction. And I think the direction I wanted to uh, go was based around um, having accumulated this data, what do we do next? What's the what? Are, what kind of politics are we trying to put together? What does this data tell us about what better or good work might look like in this sector? And ultimately, what might make for just and fair and egalitarian work in the cultural and creative industries? So I think it was that really. It was a kind of sense that things were taking off. People were writing about the creative industries. We had a lot of information, but what we I guess the position we're at now is thinking about well, what kinds of political projects can we initiate that will take us forward and make work better. Mm -hmm. So so speaking of of justice and um, incorporating more justice into the creative industries, you advocate for, uh, you phrase it as doing justice to cultural work. Um, Now, what what would that mean? Well, I suppose initially it meant, I suppose, respecting cultural work as a particular kind of practice. And but also respecting the things that people make, the objects that people produce in culture and quite a lot of the academic literature had kind of started to forget about the cultural objects, the things that people make, you know, the art or or the culture that people produce. This is kind of meaningful stuff. It's the stuff that people care about. It's the reason why they get into the creative or cultural industries in the first place, because they want to be a creative person. Um, And a lot of this kind of dialogue around the sector had started to forget that, I think, and and had stopped writing about the the cultural artifact or the text or the object that people were producing and got kind of slightly bogged down with issues, uh, with other issues, I think. So one of the the things that the book does is to try and refocus attention on the value that people gather or generate from making cultural goods. So that's part about doing justice to culture. Um, But the other sense of um, justice that the book deals with is distributive justice. And this is um, about how those objects get made and who gets the opportunity to work in culture and who gets paid and who doesn't get paid and who gets promoted and who doesn't get promoted and who who is able to participate or not in the making of those kind of cultural objects. So it's just this in a kind of dual sense, really. It's doing justice to the things that people make and the practices of work involved in production. Uh, but it's also about 
the distributive justice of who gets rewarded for working in that industry. Mm -hmm. So speaking of doing justice to cultural goods, it seems that cultural goods are often judged kind of as extensions of talent and representations of talent. Um, but in the book, you, you kind of express that in some ways, talent is a social construction, which, you know, often reproduces existing inequalities. Mm. Um, can you explain that further? Yeah, I mean, talent is a really interesting concept to me. I kind of think about it a lot and what we might uh, mean by it. Um, and talent, I suppose, is the primary um, quality of, that anyone can possess who works in the creative industries. People are talking about talent all the time. Such and such is talented or more talented or less talented. We want to unleash talent. We want to free talent. We want to make talent grow. So talent is, if you like, the, the kind of the gold, the kind of, you know, the mother load in the creative sectors. But I started to think a bit more about, well, what, what does that kind of mean? And where, where do those ideas come from? And I suppose the thing I explore in the book is how People can be talented in the sense that they have an objective capacity to do something. So, you, you know, maybe you can sing better than me. I'm, in fact, I'm sure you can. Or maybe I can play the piano better than you. Or, you know, I can uh, paint in ways that other people can't. And that would be a kind of a way in which we would look at talent as being embodied in the person and the qualities that they uh, display. So people can do things. They have capacities by virtue of being human beings. So that's a way of thinking about talent. But I think what tends to happen is that um, talent is also very much kind of socially shaped and socially constructed. And what I mean by that is that judgments of who is talented or how we recognize and identify talent is very much wrapped up with um, social divisions and social distinctions and how people are judged in a social sense. So regardless of how well you play a musical instrument, if you come from, let's say, an ethnic minority background, your chances of getting into a top music academy are much less. Um, similarly, if you come from a working class background, um, no matter how well you paint or no, no matter how well you kind of uh, are able to design, your chances of getting into um, the very best kinds of school or the very best kinds of job tend to be less. Now, if talent was just a natural capacity that everybody had, it would be equally shared and distributed in a kind of, you know, almost in a kind of random way. But what seems to happen is that judgments of talents are also kind of wrapped up with judgments about the person, how they present themselves, how they display themselves in an interview, how they dress, what their accent is, whether they're kind of articulate or communicative. And at the point of selection, if you like, for the elite art school or the job interview, these things kind of matter and they shape how people are judged as being talented or not talented. So, for example, I did some research in the UK looking at how successful black musicians were, uh, black jazz musicians were in getting into the very best kind of music academies. Um, and it turns out that they're not very successful in getting in, partly because of judgments that tend to um, assume that because they come from a particular social background, they don't embody all the qualities that the academy regards as being kind of talented. So, Musicians from ethnic minority backgrounds don't tend to have had a kind of a classical education. They don't tend to have had extra tuition. They tend to have learned their instrument in uh, community contexts that are less well-resourced, less formally taught. Um, particularly if you're black and working class, you wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to have extra lessons or tuition or to be able to practice or embody all the kind of full range and qualities of talent that an academy might select. Um, but at the point of... Um, recruitment, those things tend to be overlooked. Um, and people are often disregarded as being less talented when really what they've had is less opportunity. So I think that's what I mean by talent partly being a kind of social judgment. It's, it's wrapped up with an objective sense of what people can do. But it's overlain with all these assumptions about what kind of person they are, what kind of background they come from, how they present, how they communicate, what their life histories are really. That's how we judge the talented. It's partly... Uh, an objective but also a deeply subjective judgment and this is why this goes some way to explaining i think why so many people from disadvantaged backgrounds don't get the best uh, educational places or the best jobs mm -hmm. so on the topic of um, inequalities of opportunity within the creative industries uh, in your book you talk about internships as being a necessary gateway into creative work um, shedding light on unpaid internships and sacrificial labor um, can, can you speak more about these ideas yeah, uh, the in yeah, the internship is, I suppose, a kind of a necessary gateway. And, and in some ways, that's a good thing. Um, once upon a time, an internship was a kind of 
uh, an opportunity for people to get work experience. Um, they didn't tend to last very long. They tended to be tied to um, education programs. Uh, and they were seen as a kind of a, a, a relatively kind of easy and accessible way to get a foot in the door of the industry. And they weren't very controversial. Most people kind of accepted that they existed both inside and outside the industry. Um, I think what's increasingly happened the last decade or so is that internships have come to be seen to be very problematic, partly because they're often quite long and extensive. Sometimes they're um, offered in lieu of real work. And people doing internships can often be undertaking tasks that are more like paid employment. Um, so there's a sense that internships have become slightly exploitative, um, but, but also by the same token that the opportunity to take part in uh, an internship or to have an internship is also strongly tied to social uh, background. So if, you're, if you have wealthy parents or if you have inherited wealth and you can afford to work for free, for a longer period, and that improves your chances of getting the internship, sustaining it, and therefore, in theory, getting a job in the industry afterwards. So not only are internships kind of become more, if you like, problematic in the sense of being seen as exploitative, and actually getting one, they become more exclusive as well, because only certain people from certain social backgrounds can, can obtain them. So the, certainly in the UK, but also in kind of North America as well, they've become a kind of a political kind of hot topic. And They've become an entry point, really, for a lot of thinking about the nature of creative industries labour. A lot of the controversy that's um, emerged around the creative sector and its employment practices started with anxieties about internships. And it's subsequently spread uh, to a kind of more general concern about uh, temporary, part-time, kind of adjunct, and what's now called precarious work. So for me, and I think for a lot of um, academics and activists and people working in the industry the internship was a kind of the foot in the door of labor politics and, and a part of, and really um i suppose kick-started this growing awareness around what the nature of work is in these sectors um but your second point about uh, sacrificial labor certainly the creative sector and working in arts and culture is often of course historically been associated with sacrifice you know to be a great artist you must you know, sacrifice all kind of social ties and bonds. You must, you know, live in a garret. You must starve. You must suffer for your art. So sacrifice is, if you like, part of the DNA of creative work in that sense. But what that has tended to mean, I think, is that particularly employers uh, have been able to exploit that in certain kinds of ways. And one of the ways in which wages are kept low and conditions are kept less than ideal in various sectors is that employers know that Workers will self-sacrifice. They will go that extra mile because they love their work, because of the, the passion they feel for their art and their creativity. So sacrificial labour is somehow part of the, the nature of creative work, um, but it's at the same time it's also um, a source of some, I guess, disquiet for labour activists and for campaigners and activists because what it does is expose workers to the possibility of being uh, uh, exploited beyond... Um, you know, a reasonable kind of level, if such a thing exists. Mm -hmm. So bringing it down to the level of the individual worker and using myself as an example, okay. um, I'm a recent graduate who's trying to build a career in the creative industries. And I'm very lucky to be working with innovating uh, employment. Um, but oftentimes the best opportunities to gain meaningful work experiences are unpaid. Um, so how can creative workers entering the field navigate these decisions? And what, what advice would you give to someone who, who's faced with that kind of a decision? Yeah, I think it's really difficult. I think it's it's very hard to have any kind of hard and fast rules about um, unpaid work opportunities. And partly, I think each um, new or developing worker or people in, in position that you find yourself in, you know, they have to kind of make their own decisions in a way. And we have to respect that people will sometimes choose to work for free because they feel that's most advantageous for their career. And in some cases, it can be. And I think what I would hesitate to do is to condemn all unpaid work as bad because there are circumstances where working for free is perfectly reasonable and legitimate. So if you're, you know, let's say you're a kind of a, a, a cultural worker who's entering the, the marketplace and you're offered an unpaid position, let's say with a, you know, a very uh, impoverished charity or working for a, a film collective or working for an artistic group that doesn't have a huge amount of resource – Often working for free is the only way in which you can engage with them and they can engage with you 
in which a project can be realized. And I wouldn't want to kind of undermine the, you know, the very social notion that sometimes kind of voluntary work or working for free can be a very kind of empowering and socializing thing to do. You know, you, you might want to work for free to help others or to build a very kind of convivial relationship with an organization uh, and, you know, and, and, and to build a community of creative activity. So working for free is in itself is not a bad thing necessarily. But I think the problem with unpaid work is when, you, when the worker isn't being paid, but everybody else is. <laughs> I think there's an issue around um, particularly larger employers and corporations using unpaid internships or, uh, or various kinds of kind of free labor as a way of exploiting people um, when we know that somewhere up the chain, others are making money, others are being paid, profit is being made, or uh, if it's in a case of a public funded artistic activity, let's say through a gallery or you know a government funded initiative, um, there is there is a there is a resource available to fund the activity, but um, the worker at the bottom, if you like, isn't being paid. I think that's problematic. And if you're an individual worker, often it's very difficult to spot when that's occurring. You might be inexperienced. You know, you don't have a, a huge amount of um, comparison uh, to, uh, that you can draw upon. So often it's difficult for young creative workers to shoulder that burden of how and when, you know, to work for free. Um, but I think increasingly people in your position are coming out much more kind of politically astute and aware of what the nature of the workplace is, partly because we're talking a bit more about it in education. Um, and if you have the, you know, the self-respect and the courage and, and, and the bravery, because you need to be brave, I think, to to resist those kind of jobs where you know, major employers or well-funded um, public sector projects are, are not paying not paying you for your efforts and, you know, all power to your elbow, I say. Um, but I'm also sympathetic to the, you know, the, the situation that many people find themselves in, um, which is, you know, having to make very hard choices. Mark, we so appreciate you sharing your time and your knowledge with us here in Innovating Employment. Before we let you go, um, what are some key takeaways from your book that you would share with employers and employees within the creative industries? Um, I think there's... Well, conveniently, the book kind of ends with three kind of recommendations or three, if you like, um, um, pathways, I suppose, to a greater kind of creative justice, as I call it. And the first of those really is about respect or, or what I call objective respect. And that's about employers respecting their workers, respecting the products and the goods that they generate and treating them as, as human beings with, you know, capacities, um, with feelings, um, and and you know and with needs and desires that are kind of genuine and real, people want to get into the creative industries because they have a usually because they have a, a, a burning kind of ambition and a creativity they want to share, and the goods that they make should be supported and respected. This is what we're trying to encourage. Um, so respect for cultural goods and objects, and respect for the practices of work involved in them is really important. Um, the second thing I would say is that employers really have not just a a moral duty or a social duty, but probably a kind of an, an economic duty in a sense to ensure that the widest group of the population are able to participate in cultural work if that's what they want to do. So no one should be denied the opportunity um, to get a good education in culture or to work in the cultural industries if they can present with the right kind of you know credentials and qualifications and the more that the industry can draw from a wider social constituency, I think the better it will be, not just culturally, socially, but actually economically. A more diverse array of perspectives, ideas uh, and worldviews will be brought into the sector. And I suppose the third thing is that given the widespread um, uh, growth of precarity, low pay, kind of insecure work, really employers, um, I think, have a have a... I can, a duty to try and address those things, really. If you've got a, a more stable, kind of better paid uh, workforce, more loyal to the organization, who wants to contribute to the collective project, then surely that's better for everybody. The book is Creative Justice, Cultural Industries, Work and Inequality. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Banks' work highlights the array of challenges facing today's creative workers. But the good news is that programs like the School of Creative Industries are preparing young people for the realities of the creative sector. 
Here's graduate Naomi Brearley. I remember being really shocked in the first couple months of the program that, you know, all I was hearing was, it's going to be hard, it's going to be challenging, you're going to work for yourself, you're going to run your own business. Um, If you start your own business, you're not going to pay yourself for the first three years and good luck getting a vacation and all of this other kind of thing. So I think the program does a really good job at not sugarcoating necessarily um, what it is to be a creative worker. Um, But on the flip side of that, I feel like the general public or people who are coming into this program thinking that creative work is going to be this glamorous, wonderful career um, don't really understand kind of what they're in for. I think most young people today are quite aware about the reality of the industries and the challenges that are there. And people are still optimistic, I think. They want to follow their passions. They want to do something that is meaningful to them, uh, but they also want to make a living. So it's how to reconcile those two things. How do you get paid? But how do you do a project that you want to do that you're passionate about? I think that's an ongoing question for a lot of young people. That, again, was Dr. Miranda Campbell. We highly recommend her podcast series, Every Day We're Hustling, which provides more in-depth interviews with young people trying to turn their creative work into a career. You can find it at everydaywerehustling.com. There is no doubt that the continuous transformation of the creative sector presents an ongoing challenge to creative workers. But this capacity for change also makes it possible to envision a future that is more inclusive and respectful of its workers. Thanks to the work of the academics and emerging creatives featured on the show, as well as the FCAD Future of Work Conference, the challenges that must be overcome to reach that future are becoming increasingly visible. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Innovating Employment. If you like the show, please let us know on Twitter or Facebook. Links are in the description below. You can also find links to Professor Banks' book and, of course, to the podcast Every Day We're Hustling. Thanks again to CJRU for their support. You can tune in on your radio dial at 1280 a.m. or online using the links below. Stay tuned for our next episode on June 19th for our first broadcast in French. We'll be joined by Denise Shank to discuss the challenges employers are facing in the North around retaining and training skilled workers. Thanks for listening.